morning our text is going to be 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 through 7, but we're going to kind of go on a journey primarily through 1 Peter to get to our text this morning. And so I want us to begin just right up front at 1 Peter 1, verses 1 through 2. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ to God's elect, and notice what I have underlined, exiles scattered throughout the provinces of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through the sanctifying work of the Spirit, to be obedient to Jesus Christ and sprinkled with his blood, grace and peace be yours in abundance. Peter is writing to exiles. He's writing to Christians that are dispersed all over the Roman Empire. He's writing to Christians who are part of what was called then the dispersia, the scattering of the Jews, but now the scattering of the Christians all over the Roman Empire. Consider the first two verses that Carter read for us earlier. Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. Like such good, live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Reminded of a story about, uh, and it's a true story, about uh, two, a couple. They had been missionaries in Africa. Now, I need you to know that when they were missionaries in Africa, it was not, it was several decades ago, maybe even a hundred years ago. It was a time where Missionaries couldn't fly back and forth across the ocean. That when you traveled home or you traveled abroad, you went by ship. And so they've spent 30 years in Africa and now they're returning back to America. First time they've been on American soil for 30 years. On the ship that they're traveling with, they're traveling on, there is a politician, a dignitary. And the dignitary and his family receive VIP treatment. That does not go unnoticed by the missionary and his wife. And as they travel back, they notice that as they arrive in New York City, the gangplank is lowered and a band arrives. And there are dignitaries that arrive to greet the politician. The politician and his family make their way down the gangplank, they come on onto American soil, and they are greeted by the band, they are greeted by other dignitaries, and then they are whisked off in a car. The missionary and his wife begin to walk down the gangplank, arm in arm. And as they walk down the gangplank, the husband somewhat sighs, and he looks to his wife. He says, you would think after 30 years there would be at least someone to welcome us home. And she turned and hugged him and said, but we're not home yet. We're not home yet. Because she understood that they were exiles. It reminds me of what's said in Hebrews chapter 11, 9 through 10, talking about Abraham. By faith he made his home in the promised land like a stranger. In a foreign country he lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations whose architect and builder is God. God's people at least from Abraham on, have always been aliens. And I think we can make a case that God's people have always been aliens in this life. Because, just as that missionary's wife said, we have another home. We have another home that we are going to. And so Peter says, because of that we are aliens, we're exiles, because this is not our home. We need to live as free people. But we do not use our freedom as a cover-up for evil. But we're to live as God's slaves, to show proper respect to everyone, 
That's a key word this morning, respect. Show proper respect to everyone. Love the family of believers. Fear God. Honor. Honor the emperor. A young couple had just gotten married. And the groom thought, you know, it would be really cool for us to rent a carriage. Where they were celebrating their honeymoon, there was a place where they could rent a carriage, a one-horse carriage, and they could go on a midnight ride. They thought that would be pretty incredible. And so they take off, and the, the husband, he coerces the horse into a, somewhat of a trot. But he becomes focused on the stars, and more importantly, he becomes focused on his wife. And as he's focused on the stars and his wife, he becomes distracted of what the horse is doing. And all of a sudden, the horse is off track. The wife begin, reaches over, his new bride reaches over. She's trying to ga gain control, take control, grab the reins, and they're having a tug of war over the reins. The horse, who is so confused, decides the best case scenario is to just run into the woods. The carriage tumbles over. But their inner being is more bruised than their outer being. What had started as a star-studded moonlit ride had turned into had turned into maybe their first argument as a married couple. This morning, I believe that for a marriage to last as long as Earl's and Faye's of 67 years, Earl, I think it takes some commitment, doesn't it? I mean, those vows that you made 67 years ago, you, you made a commitment. And I'm going to guess that in your 67 years of marriage, there's been a lot of good times. But I'm guessing that sometimes Faye tried to grab the reins. And you had a tug of war over who was going to guide the one horse carriage. Is that right? But see, the commitment, the commitment, the commitment, it's like the commitment we see in Ruth chapter 1. It's not, a, it's not a marriage commitment, but it's a commitment that ought to be in marriage. It's a commitment that's read, this passage is read in countless wedding ceremonies. But Ruth replied, don't urge me to leave you or turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. Sounds like a commitment to me. Where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people. Your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. That is a lifelong commitment. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates you and me. When Naomi realized that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped urging her. This morning, I want us to know a godly commitment to marriage requires submission and respect. A godly commitment to marriage requires submission and respect. And now we've made our way to our text for the morning. Wives, in the same way, submit yourselves to your own husbands, so that if any of them do not believe the word, they may be won over without words by the behavior of their wives when they see the purity and reverence of their lives. Your beauty should not come from outward adornment, such as elaborate hairstyles and the wearing of gold jewelry or fine clothes. Rather, it should be that of your inner self, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is of great worth in God's sight. For this is the way the holy women of the past, who put their hope in God, used to adorn themselves. They submitted themselves to their own husbands, like Sarah, who obeyed Abraham and called him her Lord. You are her daughters if you do what is right and do not give way to fear. Husbands, in the same way. Sounds like he's saying, husbands, you need to pay attention to what I just said. Because in the same way, 
You're to be considered as you live with your wives and treat them with respect as the weaker partner and as heirs with you of the gracious gift of life so that nothing will hinder your prayers. I want you to know this morning that as we look at this passage, I want you to know that there, this is kind of sometimes called the household code. Household code of behavior. And, and prior to this, he talks about slaves and masters. Now, Peter doesn't talk about children and parents, but Paul almost says similar words in Ephesians chapter 5 and 6 and in Colossians chapter 3. There's uniformity in the message that they give. There's especially uniformity in the fact that they both call for submission and respect. For the purpose of drawing each other to God, but not only drawing each other, but drawing others who are impacted by your marriage, who are impacted by your relationship to God. And it is for the purpose of glorifying God. So I want us to look at a couple of lists real quick. First of all, wives are called to respect their husbands. It's interesting that he says, so you may win them over. Today, statistically, if we were to look at churches across America, we would see that there are more women attending churches today than there are men. That was likely true in the first century. It was in, in Judaism, of which much of early Christianity came out of, and still true today. And he says, I, I want you to respect your husband so that, especially, especially if, if they're an unbeliever. So that by your respect and by your behavior and by your way of life, you might win them over. Not by the words that you speak to them or at them, but you may win them over by your behavior. But I want you to notice he also says, focus on your inner beauty. Now, by the way, Peter doesn't say, okay, wives, when you get up every morning, just put on a pair of sweats, uh, put on some house shoes, and no makeup, that's good for the day. He didn't say that. But notice the word he uses is don't focus on the outward beauty. He didn't say that don't pay attention to it, but he says don't focus on it. But he says what you need to focus on is the inner beauty. Making yourself available through spiritual disciplines to God and to the Holy Spirit that dwells within you. You need to, to think about how to live out the fruits of the Spirit as God's Spirit dwells inside of you and looking at what God values and we've been talking a lot recently about what is it that God values of utmost importance. Love God and love others. And so that ought to be a part of the inner beauty that wives focus in on. And by the way, remember, he said, husbands in the same way. These things we're saying that he's saying to wives, that God is saying through Peter to wives, guess what, husbands? We need to be thinking about that too. We need to be thinking about that too. And we need to seek godly role models. He in the text gives wives a role model. A woman of faith, Sarah, who everywhere that Abraham went, she went faithfully with him. Even at times where, I've got to be honest, I would think he's disrespecting her. Oh, by the way, when we go to this next country, just kind of tell them you're my sister. That way they won't kill me so they can marry you. I don't know about you. I don't know how else to read that text other than disrespect. I mean, wives, think about it for a minute. How many of you would be excited if your husband said, hey, by the way, we're on vacation this year. Just tell everybody you're my sister. How many of you would sleep in the same room at the hotel with your wife? Not too many of us, would we? See, godly role models. And, and the one he chooses is Sarah. Sarah, the wife of the father of faith. She's dead. But I don't think he wants to limit your role models to those who've died. 
We had a bunch of godly role models stand up while ago. Maybe there's some of them that as wives and husbands we can learn from. But husbands, he says, live with your wives. You're going to preach your duh. It's what he says. You didn't catch that? He says, live with your wives. Well, what does that mean, preacher? Live with your wives. Well, I think it means you spend time with your wives. I don't think it just means you sleep in the same bed. I don't think it means you just sleep under the same roof. I think it means you spend time with your wife. So put it in a 21st century context, it means you probably need to have some common interest. I did not say you had to have every interest in common. Although I think it's healthy for one spouse to show interest in the other spouse's interest. Cindy will never, ever, I, I should never say that, but I have, I have pretty good stinking suspicion she will never kill a creature. But she gets real excited about my hunting. And you know what? I don't get too thrilled in Joanne's. I thank the Lord every time I go over there that the academy and Orschlands are on both sides. <laughs> but I have gone with my wife to look for her crafts. I am not a crafty person, but she is. I think it's so important that we live with our wives, but that we share things together that we find common interest. And I think it's so special to find common interest in the kingdom of God. And then he says, treat her with respect. Guys, we should never try to manhandle. And I'm not talking physically, although that would be true as well. We should never manhandle our wives, but he says we need to treat them as if they're precious. As if they are precious, and they are. But then I think he says, not a misprint. Kurt said, Terry, did you mean to have that twice? Yes, I did. He says, treat her with respect. Because, did you catch why? Because we are joint heirs with Jesus Christ. It's more about us sinking in the flesh. It's about us being one in the God who has made us through the blood of Jesus Christ, his joint heir. So this morning, a godly commitment to marriage requires, and a godly commitment to marriage is what it takes teenagers to be able to get to 67 years of marriage. But a godly commitment requires, Peter says it, Paul says it, it requires submission and respect. I want to challenge and this morning I know that there are some that have been overwhelmed by this message because there are some that are grieving the loss of a spouse. And I, I, I don't understand that personally, but I can only imagine. And, and there are some that are separated or divorced and, and they're struggling with the things that we're sharing this morning. But I think it is important from time to time for us to speak from this pulpit to say what God expectations are for a husband and a wife. And I want to encourage and challenge those that are married that, uh, that, are, uh, that you this week, I want you to make a list of the qualities you appreciate in your spouse. The qualities you appreciate most in your spouse. That's just challenge number one. That one will probably for most of you be easier. Here's number two. Considering the passage we just looked at, 1 Peter 3, 1 through 7, I, I want to encourage you to consider, based on that passage, what do you need to change in your life? What's one thing, as a husband or a wife, you need to change in your life as a response to that passage? What's one thing you need to do better? 
and responds to that passage. By the way, that would be a great exercise for all of us, whether we're married or not. And by the way, teenagers, that's a great exercise for you to do and others in the room that are maybe not yet married but want to be married at some point. Matter of fact, the most incredible book that I ever read, I ever used to teach teenagers on dating was called Dating, Picking, and Being a Winner. The whole concept of the book was if you want to date somebody who's a winner, you need to be a winner. And it was based on godly, godly principles. It's way out of print, but I still love that book because of that message. And so the last thing that I want to challenge uh, our married couples to do is to seek a mentor couple. That's what the text said. Somebody that you can look up to. Maybe living or dead. I think it would be healthier if it's somebody living. Maybe it's somebody that's through a, somebody through a, uh, a part of your life that, that's been down the journey you haven't been yet in life. Maybe if you're about to be empty nesters, look for a mentor couple that are empty nesters. You get the idea. You get the idea. But I, I want to encourage you to consider that this week, especially if in your marriage you find yourself hitting some rough patches. Let's talk to God in prayer. Father, as our husbands and wives this week will be considering the things, and really, Father, all of us are considering how we should live better lives before you as a result of the passage we've read today. But I pray, Father, for the couples that will be and all of us who will be doing these exercises. And I pray, Father, that you might bless us, that you will give us the ability this week to focus on our inner beauty, on our inner self, and to grow more into the image of Jesus. Thank you for Jesus and the fact that he transforms us into what you would have us to be. It's in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Those who are Christians in the New Testament, one of the images for the Christian in the New Testament is that they are married to Christ. Ephlegard Smith wrote a book concerning baptism. He entitled it, Baptism, the Believer's Wedding Ceremony. And just as a bride and groom become united in a wedding ceremony and the bride takes on the groom's name, we are united with Jesus and take on his name, Christian, in baptism. And if you've not yet been wed to Christ in baptism, the baptistry is ready this morning and we would love to help you. And sometimes couples become separated from each other and need to be reconciled. But maybe you have separated yourself this morning from Jesus and need to be reconciled. And we would love to pray for that reconciliation with you this morning. But as we sing this song, as Steve comes to lead the invitation song, I would encourage you to silently pray for the marriages of this church. Please come as we stand and sing.